I don't see the long-term metaverse being elves and fairies with a VR headset. I see it as something that's integrated with daily life as you walk around. And, and that's where these values are going to really matter who's making them, what they can do, who they do it for. That, that's where that, that stuff is so important. It's not going to be about just a game thing. Hello, world. You're listening to SpartyCast. Hello, SpartyCast fans. Is that presumptuous? Are you here against your will? <laughs> I hope not. Well, welcome to episode 39. 39, that was a good year. It was a good age long ago when I was 39, a couple of months ago, and I felt so young. And here I am in the new decade and in a new episode. That's not the point. The point is that we are talking about how lessons from game studies relate to the metaverse. My guests are the illustrious Dr. Dimitri Williams and Dr. Aaron Tremell. They are amazing games researchers. Dimitri, of course, was my advisor back at USC and continues to kick some academic asphalt with, uh, with his awesome research. And Aaron, I've known for a long time. He's a, he's a very well-respected game study scholar, brings a qualitative historical perspective to the conversation. Um, he's also a really nice guy, very insightful. We brought this conversation together. I kind of, we describe it in the in the episode itself, but I hope you find this topic interesting. The, the idea that games kind of seed uh, innovation in other technological spaces, or, or maybe games are the application that, uh, or, or the applications, games provide applications for new technologies to kind of play, to allow people to play, but also the developers to play with new modes of interaction with these technologies. Because at first we know, you know, we have electricity, but what do we do with it? Oh, model railroads. That's a great example that Aaron brings up in the episode, but also more commonly, or, or at least recently, we think about computers, computer games, and how they might feed into other types of technology use, right? People were playing MUDs and Moos, um, which are text-based online games long before uh, they were having Zoom calls. But in, in some ways, the understanding about social interactions and user experiences in the spaces helped us understand uh, the future of these technologies outside of the game context. Daisy's excited. Can you tell? Anyway, hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to SpartyCast. I am so thrilled to be here with Aaron Tremell and Dimitri Williams, two people I've known through game studies for a very long time. But why don't I let you guys introduce yourselves? I'm Aaron Tremell. I'm a, a researcher, a assistant professor at UC Irvine. I look at um, the way that games and identity really come together. And my, my special research area is on tabletop gaming and um, hobby gaming. So I look at those things in a historical, a broad ranging historical light, um, trying to understand how uh, the history of tabletop games and hobby gaming informs the history and cultures of digital gaming today. Dimitri? Uh, I am a professor at the University of Southern California in the Annenberg School for Communication. And I and the students in my lab tend to investigate social um, networky and uh, relationshipy issues in games. We like to use all kinds of weird data, uh, whether that's surveys or large scale or ethnographic, um, and answer questions about what it means to be a player um, and how people relate to each other and how the medium is or isn't the message um, in a very complex medium in a very complex time. Yes. And you were also my advisor at USC. And so I owe it all to you. <laughs> Um, and it's I, true. Robbie is my son. I will bequeath him all my knowledge. <laughs> uh, it's always, uh, and this is your second time on SpartyCast, so thank you for returning, especially from whatever wild time zone you're in. Seychelles, I am plus 11 hours from Los Angeles and plus eight hours from you. And I'm uh, uh, 1,100 miles east of the African um, mainland, so I'm just impressed this is working. Like, technology, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Aaron, how's Irvine right now? Oh, it's sunny. Uh, it's sunny like it is every day. Sunny and perfect. Um, and near the beach. 
Oh, jelly, jelly. All right. So let's talk about the metaverse where it will also always be sunny. I don't know. Maybe not in uh, in, in some of the darker mods. Our, our goal today, so the three of us, full disclosure without a full, full disclosure, we are in talks with a game company to do research uh, with them on topics related to what we're going to discuss today. This conversation serves as a bit of a a brainstorm to get ready for that research uh, because we are under NDA and we don't actually have an agreement for that research yet. Uh, we're just, we're not gonna mention exactly who we're in, in talks with. So hopefully that is a way to kind of uh, check all the ethical boxes while at the same time being able to put this conversation out in public. So if people have feedback or are otherwise interested in taking part, uh, we, we welcome that. Good with everyone? Yeah, cool, cool. All right, so um, how, how, how do games relate to the metaverse? Why are games related or, or could they be related or have they been related? Yeah, so what, one of the things I think about when we start talking about metaverse is that sort of long history of virtual reality and the role that games have always played in that long history of, of virtual reality, right? Like um, it's, it's been a project um, to, to sort of manifest the worlds that we live in, in meat space in the sort of virtual sense for like the last 30 years. And I think the metaverse is one of the sort of more cutting edge developments in that long arc of a virtual reality narrative that we're seeing today. A long, long arc, like decades, right? right. Yeah, very, very long arc. I'd say that um, in the same way that science fiction often um, helps provide the art of the possible, um, for what's coming next, you know, half the people at NASA were, you know, Star Trek nerds. Many of us teach this material, the idea that um, sometimes it's the ideation and the socialization of something that then actually makes it possible later. And from this sort of, you know, possibility space of, of fiction, you've got a really strong parallel with what's happening in games in that game worlds and game spaces have basically laid down a lot of the assumptions and quote unquote laws, um, best practices, worst practices, wheels that need to be reinvented many times by people investing capital, I'm sure. Then they're done that with a bunch of different virtual worlds over the last X de decades, right? Um, but they really laid the groundwork for how and what we could expect. So game spaces have been the default really for how we think about and how people are building these things for better or worse because that's the track record we have. Some people stand on the shoulders of giants. Some people stumble around and forget there's a giant behind. A giant orc in this, in this case. Um, and Dimitri, your work on social capital and, and groups online have often focused on game contexts, but I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they necessarily needed to be in games. You argued that we could kind of map social behaviors from these virtual spaces uh, in ways that helped us understand social behaviors in general. But the games and many the social interactions in those spaces are very similar to what we'll see in the metaverse when it's not game related, right? Absolutely. Um, so I I fancy myself a systems thinker rather than a pure game scholar. Um, what does that mean? Other than sounding super pretentious. Um, I think we, we take a look at the, the structures and systems that are out there, and that has a really big, strong predictive power over how people are going to behave. So you take the same people and you drop them into, you know, Moscow or Minsk or Washington, D.C. or Beijing, and they're going to behave in a different way because of the social environment around them and also because of the laws and the structures, and the infrastructure around them. I mean, it's easier to get around from A to B. What's acceptable behavior is different in all these different places. So while I think we're all unique snowflakes and I believe in the power of human agency, there's no denying to me the, the really strong power of the system itself, the rules and games we use the term affordances or social architectures. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all people dropped into systems and those systems affect our behaviors. Games are a fantastic laboratory to um, test those ideas out in safe and ethical ways, um, while the real world is doing weird, crazy shit on its own in unsafe and unethical ways. Um, and as you said, I've used this term mapping to say there are some times when what you've learned in the virtual can apply to the real um, and vice versa. It can be a sandbox to test it. The line between the two becomes more and more permeable as metaverses overlap um, and overlay um, real meat space, as Aaron uh, said a little while ago. Um, but still the lessons learned are all there. Um, 
and we can learn a lot from watching people in each space to know about what they're gonna do in the other. Yeah, and I, I really like what you're putting down there, Dimitri, um, centering the view on people, right? Like no matter how much the technological paradigms that we live in change moving forward, at, at its heart, every technology is really a story about the people using it and working with it. And like you're saying, those affordances change a little, but the, the key is to focus on what happens with the people in that space, not necessarily what happens with the circuits. No, we care about how the circuit makers and the programmers and the coders do things and may or may not have any kind of sociological or cultural thinking going on. Many of them are deeply thoughtful. Many of them are doing it by accident, but there are real effects on the people. And ultimately, that's what we care about. So um, maybe with a bit of a, an STS, science, technology, and society, or science and technology studies um, angle to this question, we were thinking about the technologies of the games kind of guiding, and then the metaverse, of course, guiding the way that people interact with each other, and that influences culture. But at the same time, uh, people and culture influence the development of technology, right? Demand for certain technologies or or funding, et cetera, and stock prices. So how do you see the development of game and now metaverse technologies kind of evolving together in ways that relate to the cultural and social developments of, of these technologies? There's a ton of capital flowing into these spaces right now, right? And so the demand there is purely financial. And so this is about return on investment. This is about fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. And this is about trying to maximize profits and grow. But I think even the most ardent capitalist knows that it has to fit and make sense in a social context, right? You can't um, take something that isn't acceptable to a culture and hope to make money off of it. So there's always a back and forth between the people who are uh, making these things and want to make a buck and the audiences where it has to have some kind of organic fit or appeal. So the human baseline is always there, no matter what the structures and affordances we put in. At the end of the day, people still need to relate. People still need to love. People still need to express identity and passion and meet and socialize. So that's the backdrop upon which all this is going and is never going to change. There are a bunch of human needs. I think I totally dodged your question, but I hope I used that buzzwords to at least buy the time for Aaron to come up with something. Well, I, I think I'd build on that. I'd, I'd say that with within that um, slurry of buzzwords that you just used, <laughs> I, I think that there's opportunity also. Um, I think that, you know, when you have something like a lot of capital in one space and a lot of people with a lot of interest in something, that gives the developers, that gives the designers an opportunity to, to make a product, to make a game maybe that that will resonate with an audience better than it might have resonated if that opportunity, if that, that backdrop hadn't been set, right? And that, that can be great, right? Like that can be a, a gateway into further inclusivity in games. Um, that can be a gateway into games that might save the world or games for change, right? There's lots of ways that that opportunity might be seized in a really interesting and advantageous way, but it is still up to, you know, the designers and the people working in that space to kind of grok that opportunity and, and uh, make the most of it. Sure. So, and, and on that topic, let's take it further. Inclusivity in games has become a very important issue over decades. Of course, we've been talking about representations and characters and then gender norms. Um, and then of course, race and the, uh, the social and cultural movements promoting racial equality uh, have really heated up in the game space in the last few years, how might we see those cultural responses to games and the technology of games seep into the development of metaverse, non-game, but still online mediated interactions? My first response to that is going to be a little pessimistic because I think we've, we've seen a lot of toxicity in games up to this point. And I think that's kind of the challenge that developers have to design against right now is to not let some of these more negative aspects that have followed games around for a while seep into that. Then again, you know, there, like I'm saying, there is a possibility here. There's a genuine possibility for intervention to have greater inclusivity. But I, I think it'd be a mistake not to recognize how for many games um, have been a hostile space for a long time. And we have to actively understand that in order to think through how to counteract it. 
we got a panel of dudes here who are, we're part of the problem. There isn't enough diversity among the ranks of producers, and this is in turn created by the lack of people entering computer science programs to become developers from a more, a more diverse uh, background from a number of demographic categories, but most notably gender. And that goes basically to turning off girls from STEM fields in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So that's the root of the problem. We need to get in there. We need to we need to empower young girls to get into technology so they become the creators so that they make systems and worlds that make sense to them. And it's not just dudes making things for dudes because you know any creator makes things that they know about. So Hollywood writes about Hollywood. Writers write about writers. You know, how many Stephen King books are about writers? So there's this, you know, endless Ouroboros. There's my other fun buzzword for the day of um, creative talent simply making what it knows and nothing else. So we've got to get those people in there. That said, Aaron's right. There's a great possibility space here. And um, I'd love to have a conversation about what these spaces can do um, and could empower, um, especially as we potentially get away from game only uses and into broader everyday civic uses, which I think is where this is eventually going to go. I, I don't see the long-term metaverse being elves and fairies with a VR headset. I see it as something that's integrated with daily life as you walk around. And, and that's where these values are going to really matter. Um, who's making them, what they can do, who they do it for. That, that's where that, that stuff is so important. It's not going to be about just a game thing. Yeah, I, and I think building on that, I, one of the most inspiring game moments that happened, I think, over the entirety of my life was when Pokemon Go came out. And I think, right, when we start thinking about the sort of like collectivity, the way that bodies got reconfigured around that game, how consumerism got reconfigured around that game, right? Like there were sales that were taking advantage of landmarks near them from that game. You start to see the possibility of what could happen with a metaverse game situation that um, plans itself shrewdly and is able to take advantage of you know, like what Dimitri was saying earlier, like uh, the human features, things that people want, things that people want to do, you know, a, a moment that really brings people together around that technology. Absolutely. So how about some specific ideas about inclusion in metaverse spaces, drawing from lessons of what you've studied on toxicity or other types of social interactions in games. And just to give you an example uh, that is probably all too common, people get together in VR hangout spaces and they invade each other's physical space. They get too close. Maybe they touch your avatar in a way that you, you don't want. There are stories of this. There are stories of people wearing body haptic suits so they can feel touch and then someone comes along and, and touches them in an unwanted ways in VR. And, and that, of course, is very violating. Um, so a simple solution that I, I've heard of is to create space bubbles, right? So it prevents people from getting within your close proximity. And I'm like, how, how did they not think of that first after the decades of problematic game use and, and discussions around this we've had? And, and I get it, right? It wasn't embodied in the same way before, but are there other things that we know as game scholars that apply to social interactions in the metaverse that maybe we should hype up to help prevent uh, unwanted social interactions or to promote wanted ones? Yeah, I, I mean, I, in that lessons learned category, I'm, I'm thinking of um, an old game that Lindsay Grace, who's a game designer, it was an art game that he made called Big Lovin'. And the idea was you had a teddy bear as your interface and you would hug the bear to get over like the blocks and challenges you, you'd encounter along the way. Um, but I remember talking to him about that and he said that it got to be a problem because the playtesters of the game um, discovered quickly after uh, playing it that it was more efficient to I think like slam the teddy bear or punch the teddy bear to jump over the things and so this whole game that was designed around like hugging and affection um, actually brought out the opposite in the players and I, I think this is the eternal problem for game designers is you know this happened also with uh, what's the Ultima Online right where they they put out like this whole ecosystem of creatures and the gamers found a way to murder every single one to harvest them for like crafting materials after like uh, 
a week online or something like that. So I think this is the eternal problem is how to incentivize behaviors that um, really get people uh, communicating and interacting in, I, I think, uh, a less aggressive way with each other in that game space. Love that example. My favorite uh, um, tale and fix on this is from Larry Lessig's code book, which I can't believe I'm still teaching a zillion years later, but it's still so good. And it was from some early space where it was the, the one character who had poisonous flowers and the other person had a virtual dog and a virtual dog came along and ate the poisonous flowers and then died. And everybody was freaked out, like, hey, you ate my flowers. Hey, you killed my dog. And, and then why not just make the flowers not poisonous when they touch the ground? It's just a reminder that when we, we bring all these, like, obvious human constructs into things, that there are lateral solutions for thinking differently and creatively about them. Because you could fly if you want to. You could blank in a virtual space. So these same strictures aren't always there. I, I'm really wary of... Um, telling game developers how to do their job because they're so much better at it than me. The UX and UI people are, are now legion and are working and are good at this stuff. Um, I think what we can probably bring to bear is a, a long history of what diffuses well and what doesn't. And probably the main lesson there is that, you know, if you want something to work and take off, um, people got to be able to see it. They got to be able to understand it. They have their friends got to do it. And most importantly, it's got to fit culturally. And if it doesn't, it, this is not going to work. So like Pokemon Go fit because people can walk around outside and they like to walk around outside. But if you'd ask them to, you know, go up and slap a teacher or something, it wouldn't have worked as well. Maybe they scored a lot of points, but that wouldn't have fit in their daily lives and their cultural values and their systems. So little things like that, does it fit? Those kind of overarching messages, we're good at that stuff. Um, telling them that their buttons should be red and not blue were useless. So don't ask us. Yeah, and I think I think that that right that goes back to the, that question about like how to design tech. And you know, I think this is in uh, informatics what we'd call user centered design. Like you were saying, any UX developer is really studied in these things. But starting with the user, thinking about user values, thinking about um, the culture and the presuppositions of a user as a way to understand you know like that that solid foundation for what something like the metaverse could be i think you know for sure has to be the path forward here and, and by the way i'm i'm totally pushing a vision in my subtext of stuff that overlays real space rather than fantasy spaces so that cards on the table that's where i think this is going and that's what i'm arguing around with my assumptions i think this is different if it's VR goggles, or it's just more online virtual spaces. I think, and I'm happy to talk about that stuff. That's you know bread and butter. But for game technology to enter the real world, we have to start talking more about the real world spaces. Like, how is this going to work outside on city streets? How is this going to work in schools? How is this going to work inside offices? How is this going to work when you go to a bar and you're trying to meet somebody that you're interested? In? Those are interesting spaces where we can learn from things we've done in games, but the setting and the context are very different and very new. And that's that's where I think things like um, Pokemon Go are really informative, right? Like, because they, they yeah. show us how this has worked and, and specifically how fantasy has worked in real spaces, which is interesting. But then you can go to like something like a Ren Fair where everybody's in costume, right? And you get that, that sort of, I don't know, it's like a magic circle happening there where yeah. there is an understanding that this is a space of fantasy and there's affordances allowed for that. But then if you take some, you know, the opposite, um, something like uh, those Renfair people in garb then going out into the real world, trying to go to the bar, that's where it gets more complicated um, because you don't necessarily have that clean intersection of cultural presuppositions going into this space. Yeah, totally. Everybody must've watched the uh, Hawkeye on Disney Plus recently. It's a great Renfair moment. What if you're, taking that into the bar and people who opt in can see the outfit and people who don't, don't, you know, so you've got the, the, the poisonous flowers not hitting the ground. You've got the lateral solution where people are overlaying with different things and seeing different things, different spaces. It's going to create some funky separations and I would assume a lot of signaling of who you are and what your, you know, norms are in that space. Like, if all three of us are in the bar, but Robbie's not in Renfair virtual costume, the two of us are, 
to, can the three of us still talk, you know, or is it going to be weird when, you know, you start saying stuff and, and how do you do the equivalent of um, out of character? You say, Oh, oh see Robbie, get me a beer. You know, I mean, but, you know, we've got, we've got to come up with some interesting norms when we've got different layers practiced by different people in the same space, weird, weird stuff like that's going to happen. It's not going to be, that's not going to be 90% of people's daily lives. Those are going to be the funny edge cases. They're going to be, you know, feature stories, you know, man bites dog stories in Wired Magazine. Um, and we're going to do studies on them and eat them up. But for the most part, it's going to be more mundane stuff about navigating down the street. Um, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about Ren Fair and cosplay and role playing. It seems to me underlying this question about the connection between game technology and just non-game metaverse type technologies is a technological diffusion question. And early adopters, at least with these types of technologies, computing technologies, do seem to be gamers. And I, I wonder, is that driven more by the types of applications that are built or the types of people who want to try the newer tech and, and, and want to do something gamey or playful with it. Like, do you think there will always be this, this socio-technical kind of uh, merger of early adopters and, and game-like applications at, at these different stages of it being VR, AR, et cetera? Yeah, I, well, I think historically that, that, that comes from, you know, some of the incentives that games have offered early adopters of technology. For example, right, like it's the 1970s, you go out and you buy this computer, it's not going to do much, right? It's going to make a spreadsheet if you're lucky. Uh, let's say the 80s, but you're probably not buying a computer in the 70s, you know, rare. But you, you find that Sierra Adventure game on the shelf at the Babbage's or wherever you're going to buy your game, and you think to yourself, oh, well, I might be able to play this game with this computer I bought, right? So games have historically been the sort of like killer app for the technology, right? You buy that iPhone and what are you going to do with it? Well, it, it does calls, it does texts, it does internet, which is, is its own killer app. But, oh, there's an app store and there's a bunch of games here that you can play with here. So I feel like they've always been that sort of thing in some ways that justifies the purchase, right? Like it's that way to say like, okay, I bought this thing, I want to have fun with it, and now I can have fun with it. And that's, I think, what we've seen games really doing and why we've seen these early adopters of tech happening in game spaces over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, Saturnalia, it's liminal spaces, it's um, the right to mess around. Isn't it funny how every time there's um, a new platform shows up, games are the biggest thing on it and everyone's like, but that's not what it was for. <laughs> and that's not how we're building it. And no, we don't expect to make all our money from it. Okay, I guess we're making all our money from it. Okay, I guess this is a thing now. Games are the largest medium in the world by far, but larger than all the rest of them put together. You know, I don't know how people are going to watch this podcast, Robbie, but it's not going to hit 40 million views. And we're talking about the most powerful thing on the planet. And it's like, we're like little niche thing in a corner. So it doesn't get the cultural respect and gravity it deserves, but so what? The effects are real. And this is where creative things happen. Right? This is where people feel the ability to try new stuff and it draws and empowers people to do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, just like you get, you know, a lot of energy out of fan fiction, you get a lot of energy out of game spaces. They allow you to go do whatever you want. And, and then you get things like, you know, Media Molecules Dreams game, which is a game to make games and, and, and games that have their own platform building. So when you get the tools, you put them out there in a place where people are already um, socialized and told playing is okay, playing is the thing, playing is the point. Well, that's when creativity happens. And don't look now, but creativity is what makes new IP and makes people money. So whether people take it seriously or not, you get a lot of great stuff coming from these spaces. So it, it's no surprise that games are an origin for so much creativity. I almost wonder if the playfulness that <clears throat> we associate with games aligns well with the experimental nature of many of these newer technologies. So maybe they're, yeah. they're not advanced enough to rely on for work, but we can, we can at least try out some game things with this 
uh, new chip or hardware or software, whatever it is. And once the developers work out the kinks, it's almost like the developers are the ones who are playing, right? They're the, they're creating things. They don't know if it's going to work. They're experimenting um, based on how users literally play the games on them, kind of reinforces the modes of user interaction that, that will um, succeed into will will be on like the the will pass evolution by uh, technological selection <laughs> into the next iteration of work and social applications. That's so interesting, Robbie. I think um, I I completely agree with you. Um, and this I think goes back to the pipeline issues with STEM that Dimitri um, was talking about a bit ago, right? With um, who has access to that leisure? Who feels like they're um, empowered to play in these spaces. I think of Christina Dunbar Hester's work on geeks and geek culture, where she's gone in uh, and done some ethnographic surveys around like the way that geeks operate um, around technology and who has access to tinker and surprise, surprise, right? It's a very gendered phenomenon where, where men feel like they can open up that box and get in there nine times out of 10. And women don't feel like that permission is as easily given to just kind of tinker and play around with things. And I, like you, I would like this utopic world where everybody feels like that that box is open to tinker and uh, with and play with. And I, I think the question is, how do we get there? I mean, just as I think, you know, trying to trying to look for connections here between game tech and a non game tech. Back to that issue of getting girls into the STEM pipeline, uh, Dimitri, you've heard me spout this one off a million times. It's not just so that we can have uh, girls who become women, who become game developers, who then influence uh, representations in those spaces, but it's also that the game tech itself influences interests in STEM fields. So I, I guess slowly but surely we have an increasing representation, but if game environments are toxic or otherwise uh, kind of triggering stereotypes about gender, the the women and girls who are turned off from the gaming experiences will also be turned off from STEM fields, or at least that's what the argument and that's what some of the data suggests. Tinkering and experimenting, I mean, it, we need a cultural change that influences not just games, but also technology writ large. So I've got an interesting example to kind of talk through with you both. So there's um, a professor at UC Santa Cruz, Kate Ringland, Catherine Ringland, and um, she researches um, part of Minecraft called Autcraft. And so what Autcraft is, is a Minecraft server that only autistic folks can use and only autistic folks have access to. And for the, and they're mostly kids. There's like age restrictions put on the folks who use this, this server. And what, what you have in the space becomes this really amazing sort of like um, area where you have people who have kind of created this utopia to play around in, to tinker around in, where they don't feel excluded from social practices and they feel like there's a constructive group of people sitting there and saying like, hey, um, I have a similar experience as you do and um, it's, it's great to be able to make a friend in this space and stuff like that. We do see in some examples with games, right, like these really, really powerful experiences that bring people together in new ways um, and excite new kinds of collaboration. And I guess I was just wondering what you, you both might think of that as a sort of model for what the metaverse could be or the metaverse could do as a way to bring people together with like a similar background or a similar interest. I'm just gonna pick up on the safety aspect of it. That's, I've never heard that case before. Um, and I've got a son on the spectrum who likes Minecraft. So thank you for the tip. Having a safe spot to create um, and using tools to mediate that is, one of the best uses of technology. It, it can be such a, a bringer of hatred, um, but it can also be a safe space and it can also empower you. Think about the, um, I always use this, I don't know, maybe it's a cliched example, but if there was somebody who was like a, uh, a gay teen in a very conservative small town, must feel very isolated, but with technology can reach other people to um, express their identity more openly and freely, right? These technologies shine when they let people do things that they couldn't do or aren't allowed to do in regular space. And back to this kind of overlay idea, maybe they can even do it sitting next to you and you don't know it. The potential is, is certainly there. No, I think that's part of it. Um, and I know they had they have rules and, and practices. It, she She's written a lot on it. I, I remember a study we did like 10, 15 years ago where we found that in role-playing games, 
minority groups, whether it was sexual orientation or gender or religion, were in them in their more disproportionately role playing. And I remember thinking to myself, they're not role playing. This is just where they can be themselves, right? This is where an accepted safe space. The, the stats were just too obvious that that's how it was trending. If those same things can be layered onto real space, um, to be yourself without resorting to escapism, that's really healthy. Yeah, totally. The, the, the first attack was like, oh, these people are just running away from their problems. And then when we did interviews with them, no, they weren't. Not at all. They knew exactly what was going on. But this was their safe space and they could be themselves where they couldn't locally. So back to the issue of gender inclusion, if we can see the metaverse as providing the opportunity for safe spaces, um, then maybe safe spaces to promote inclusive gender, inclusive cultures to get interested in STEM fields, right? Maybe that's easier offline, sorry, online in the metaverse than it is offline. And that might lead to more women in game design and development, which would then uh, kind of self-perpetuate, hopefully, that trend. Another, another thing I've seen, I used to do ethnographic research on Magic the Gathering players, and when, uh, including online players, and one thing that came out was that some players, some women, would play the game online only because actually that sort of anonymity allowed them to play the game um, in a way where they felt like they weren't being scrutinized for their gender um, in that play space. And so you can imagine filters or things getting built into technology that allow people, afford them a sort of anonymity when they want it, um, that can allow for a safer kind of play moving forward too. And with that, no SpartyCast episode is complete without Robbie talking about avatars for as much as he can. <laughs> and many- you go, boy. Many, many studies, including some work, some vehicles in there. <laughs> yes, avocars as well. Um, yeah. D- Dimitri and it's I to- totally <laughs> fair game, and it's true. Absolutely, you know, if we if we have avatar, if we know how people respond to their avatars in game spaces, it's very likely those social rules, those norms, will persist in non-game metaverse-like spaces. And of course, there are important lessons to be learned there. So. Um, yeah, just patting ourselves on the back for doing that research years ago, and now it's relevant to work and social contexts that are not gaming. But yeah, let's wrap up with a with a, a closing round here. Uh, leave us with a zinger, um, and whoever wants to go first. I've got some current current uh, hot takes that I've been meeting. I've been shouting from the hilltops. But yeah, so I've been doing research on hobby games. Um, and this took me to the, the history of uh, model say, railroads. Are you saying hobby games? Sorry, hobby. Hobby. Can you tell us what hobby means? Hobbies, like um, hobbies, like things that people do in their spare time. Oh, I thought it was an acronym. No, 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 no. Hobby. Hobby games. rhymes with Robbie. Okay. Go yeah, on. exactly. Um, and that it took me back um, to, to model railroads because a lot of the hobby game communities in the 50s and 60s grew out of the model railroad hobbyist communities in um, the turn of the, the 20th century. And anyway, so this story is really interesting in regards to technology, because what you what you have is um, model railroads rolling out across the United States with the electrical grid, because you needed electricity to make your model railroad, and electricity wasn't everywhere. And so if you just got electricity in your big mansion, right, you, you had this thing, you had lights all of a sudden, What's that, that thing that you play with? Well, the killer app at that time at like, you know, 1900, 1910 was a model railroad set. And so you see this sort of like um, replication of play still being the thing that drives um, the technology and drives adoption of the technology dating back to even before we had like things that weren't board games or things like that going back to model railroads. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I think that was a, a really interesting finding that that totally relates to the conversation we just had. Well, I do not have a zinger. Oh, here's the, here's the, here's the terrible self-promotion. Um, I wrote a, uh, a chapter a couple of years ago in a, a book that I don't know, probably hundred people have read um, with uh, my PhD student Donna Kim about um, layers in the real world. And I, maybe I should have, thrown it in comp theory or something. I thought it was really important in the way of thinking about what's our everyday life like and how, when we can put stuff on top of that, are these functions going to be different? And a lot of that is game technology, but um, some of it's a combination of game norms and ideas with other new technologies. 
the coolest thing I saw from CES this year, Super Electronics Show, um, was AR um, contact lenses. I just thought it was so damn cool. It's and, and it and it sounds like some science fiction thing that's going to happen in twenty years, but they're working right now, literally right now. And they you can get a prescription, um, and they they were closing a deal with Bausch and Lomb. I don't know if this company did or not. There are actually two companies that were doing it, but it worked. And so instead of having glasses or a device or whatever, you could just be wearing contacts and it's working in conjunction with your cell phone. So you can now have that overlay that we were talking about in the paper a couple of years ago, walk down the street and do voice commands or whatever the heck input you need. So we're almost there with walking out and seeing things on top of other things. And so how cool is this going to be when this technology involves us sitting around, as we were saying with the Renfair example at the bar, and we're playing whatever nerd thing we're doing. We're playing Settlers of Catan, but we're doing it and there's no piece on the board. We all just see it, right? Because we're all wearing these contact lenses. This is probably the lamest example possible, but it's the first one coming into my head. And what's going to happen socially when, you know, a bunch of us are sitting around a table pointing at something that isn't there and everybody else at the round the bar is going to be like, those guys are dorks, <laughs> right? They won't there's going to be this really interesting mishmash. They won't call you People can see, holes. people can't. What will what will they call you instead of glass holes? It'll be lens heads or something. It'll be staring off into space. I mean, you know, it's you know, I'm looking at my teenage kids staring off into space with their phones. I mean, they were always be, there's going to be like this this glazed eye thing, and you can't tell if the person is deep in thought, doing something constructive, or just stoned. You won't know. It'll be any of those three, right? Talk about a liminal space as you're walking around. Hey, are you doing something deep? No, it's just stone. It's California. It's legal there. <laughs> oh, what about you, Robbie? You got you got to leave us with a zinger too. Oh, what's a zinger? Well, um, we we analyzed some data about perceptions of the metaverse and like uh, value of NFTs. Of course, people are willing to spend more on NFTs if they happen to also be the type of person who buys game items. Not surprising, um, but the cool the cool kind of unexpected finding here is. We compared willingness to pay for avatar clothing um, as, as just a thing that you can use, but not an NFT or as an NFT, and then also crossed with branded or not branded. And in the, both the branded and the non-branded conditions, NFTs didn't make a difference. People didn't care to spend more to own the thing as an NFT, despite the fact that there's all this discussion and all this uh, investment going into NFTs, but branded had like a 30% increase. And this is a, a quick first pass of, of that data, but, um, but people are willing to spend a, a bit more for brand, branded virtual items in the metaverse, but not necessarily to own, own them. It totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. I mean, what, do, do you want to own something that nobody else owns or or, and if you do, it's because you want to be a unique snowflake. But most people don't want to be a unique snowflake. Most people want to fit in. Well, I think the NFT and be thing, cool. But it doesn't necessarily mean no one else has it. It just means that I could resell it. You could buy the same, you know, cool jacket that I have and have it on your avatar as an NFT as well. But Fortnite won't. I let the norm. Me. The norm was that it was fairly that for for many. The appeal was the uniqueness of it that that's going no? away because it's you can mint it? you can mint multiple um nfts of the same thing and so they oh. can be completely le legit you know like you can have like 30 prints of my limited edition art object right so there's still multiple yeah. of the same one gotcha so gotcha. There's, there could cool. be scarcity involved but um i think it's more about the ownership well whatever it is it's the sneeches from dr seuss so it, we don't need to teach any class we just need to show them the sneeches and that's the end of all of our lectures it's just do you have a star on your chest or not? That's all it is. Now the NFT just says how many people, how many, how many people can have the unique stars and how many people can't. Yep, yep. Well, NFTs totally would have messed up that story, right? We would have gone through the machine and gotten stars taken on and off and on and off, but the NFTs would have tracked it, and the elite bastard sneeches would have maintained their power over the poor starless sneeches. So, boy, that NFTs would have destroyed Dr. Seuss in retrospect. <laughs> what was he thinking? Yeah. Well, there thank you, have you. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us here on SpartyCast. And I hope we continue this conversation through other kind of mechanisms. But uh, but this was a great jumping off point. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it was Thanks great being us. here. See you in the metaverse. Stay metaversatile.
All right, that was our episode with Dr. Aaron Tremell and Dimitri Williams. Grateful to have them. Really interesting topic, right? Games, technology, the metaverse, uh, the future of interactions and augmented physical spaces that are not necessarily game-like, though we can think of games as a way to understand them. Daisy's still excited. (laughs) Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.